Welcome back to today's video. Today is Sunday, September 15th, 2024, and today officially marks 50 days until the 2024 presidential election set to take place this coming November. With less than two months to go, this presidential election has taken many different forms. We've seen the political betting markets swing back and forth and the political betting uh, odds and tabulations on places like Nate Silver's prediction and on 538 and on The Economist and on the race to the White House on multiple forecast sites. This race has truly been a toss up from the very beginning. And ever since Kamala Harris entered into the race, one thing is clear. She has changed the trajectory of this race all to the benefit of the Democratic Party in a number of these battleground states, as well as on the national landscape, especially when it comes down to down ballot races. A big reason that President Biden said when he was talking about why he decided to drop out of the race was largely because not only were his numbers hurting himself in his candidacy, but also many Democrats down ballot. With Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket, the concern for many of these down ballot races isn't as high as it was before, but the presidential race remains as evergreen as always as a battleground uh, overall toss-up scenario, and it is still very competitive 50 days out. And so I thought it'd be interesting. I always do these videos two weeks, uh, every two weeks, an election prediction update. My last one was on September 1st. It just so happens that 50 days out from the election, we end up around the middle of the month here uh, in September, and we're at a really interesting point. We're right after the first and only presidential debate between Vice President Harris and former President Trump, and we're also at a unique point, too, in that national numbers are starting to turn the tides in favor of Kamala Harris, as well as a number of statewide polls. Some really strong polls today out of the state of Iowa and on the national level, ABC News and Ipsos showing Kamala Harris up six points nationally in the state of Iowa. We see a poll from uh, Des Moines Register as well as Ann Seltzer. They work together on that poll here. The most accurate pollster in Iowa dating all the way back to 2008. They say Donald Trump is ahead by just four points across the state. The reason why that matters is because Donald Trump won the state by eight points in the last election, eight, nine points. And so looking at our total electoral map here, we are in a very interesting circumstance in that this is probably one of the more poor places to be for Donald Trump on the national scale compared to where he has been before. We've seen time frames. In fact, the immediate aftermath of the presidential debate between Biden and Trump, my prediction there gave Donald Trump not only the states he won in 2016, but expanded beyond that and won the state of Nevada as well, making it 312 electoral votes. It was a margin of victory that was the largest for any Republican in the 21st century, if it came to be true, and would be very strong uh, for Donald Trump against Joe Biden. But obviously, Democrats recognized that that was not the way they wanted to go. They didn't want to slow walk into a second Trump presidency. So instead, they decided that they were going to approach this election differently. Joe Biden dropped out of the race. Kamala Harris came in and the rest is history. But we are 50 days until history is made, with the second female vice, uh, nominee for President of the United States on the Democratic ticket. Not to mention the fact that this election, should Kamala Harris be elected, she in fact would be the first woman president, the first Asian American woman president, the first black woman president. We would be in a position where there would be a lot of history on that end. Another side of the historical aspect of it, too, is that Donald Trump would be the first president to return to office after losing re-election since Grover Cleveland. And so we are really in uncharted territory here. Not much of a precedent set on either side of the aisle here. But overall, this election, as is in the nature of how uh, historical in theory this election would be for both sides, uh, it's still very competitive. And so we're at here, Kamala Harris at 180 electoral votes. Let's throw in Maine's uh, first district here. Uh, I would even argue Maine at large, I think recently has moved over more and more so as Kamala Harris has started to grow her share uh, of white voters across the country, suburban voters across the country, and started to really make a play for some of these more uh, rural areas that Democrats are undeniably going to lose in. But the whole motto here from the Democratic Party is lose better than before, meaning that they'd rather lose by 30 points than 40 points because it helps make up the margin across these states. Maine is one of those states where I think we're going to see an example of how heavy investments in the New England region because of New Hampshire will have a residual effect on a state like Maine, not to mention the fact that Kamala Harris has seen an improvement in terms of favorability, an improvement in terms of vote share amongst white voters, states like Maine and New Hampshire, huge, huge, huge areas uh, for voters on the Democratic side. So Kamala Harris had 183 electoral votes in the safe column. Donald Trump right now at zero, but let's go ahead and get through all of his states that we were going to de uh, deem to be safe from nearly the very beginning. So these are states like Nebraska, states like Wyoming and South Dakota and North Dakota. You might be surprised to see that at initial glance, not every state you would expect to be safe red is going to be characterized as safe red. So I'm not going to spend too much time really pulling away from that. What I do want to point out is that Donald Trump is in a position with just marginal differences from the 2020 election. Some of these states that used to be characterized as safe that were on the cusp of being likely states. States like Montana that in the last election went to Donald Trump by 16.4%. 
a reduction of just 1.5% makes Montana a likely state. And I think based on where we are today, we are going to find that Donald Trump does win states like Montana and Kansas and Mississippi, not by safe margins, but by 14, 15, maybe 13 point margins that I would say right now does in fact fit in the characterization as a likely red state. It might be shocking for some Republicans to see it like that, but I want to provide the nuance there because it's important to note, this isn't me saying Kamala Harris is going to win these states. It just means based on margin, we have seen some minor reductions in these states, but that does actually tell a larger story on the national scale. Getting back to the point here and not getting too lost in the weeds, states like Nebraska's first, Kansas, Mississippi, South Carolina, Montana will all share a characterization of likely Republican. But Donald Trump will, in fact, win these states by double digits. There are some likely states in the Republican column that are not going to be double digit victories for Donald Trump, meaning anywhere between five to 10 points is going to share that likely characterization. And so you'll see that really come across a number of these battlegrounds. But right now, not even necessarily battlegrounds across the remaining uh, toss of states here. But right now, I want to go ahead and focus on some of those states that Kamala Harris is going to win by a double digit margin. And we should also characterize by a likely characterization. States like Colorado, which went to Biden by 13.5 in the last election, I could even see an argument that if things get better for Kamala Harris from now, Colorado becomes safe blue. New Mexico in 2020 went to, to uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris by 10.1%. No reason to believe why we wouldn't see something similar today. I do think, though, it could narrow down a little bit, even if other states are moving in a different direction. I think we have seen some uh, losses in support in some of these states that Democrats aren't heavily focusing on that do border uh, the southern border, right? You're talking about groups of voters that might be a little bit more willing to turn away from the Democratic Party at this point in time. But overall, still, Kamala Harris wins the state. And so New Mexico, Colorado are states that I would characterize to be likely Democratic states. But I'd also throw in states like Virginia and Minnesota and New Hampshire. Now, Minnesota, I think as we get closer to election day, we'll start to see more data points showing Kamala Harris had by eight, nine, 10 points. That's roughly what we saw Tim Walz do back in 2018. And he got really close to that back in 2022. Donald Trump also lost the state in 2016 and lost it in 2020 by seven points in both Minnesota and New Hampshire. And so it's not too far off to see why they're likely states this time around as well, especially with the vice presidential nominee hailing from the state of Minnesota. In Virginia, it's a state that Biden won by 10 points. Double-digit state, I don't see Kamala Harris underperforming that, and Republicans really have not seen any major investments in the state, despite cries from the Virginia GOP, people like Glenn Youngkin really trying to plead with the national GOP to reinvest in the state, because right now it's a one-man show, and that one-man show is set to leave the governorship in just around a year because he's term-limited and we can't run for re-election. Anyways, besides that point, Virginia, Minnesota, Colorado, New Mexico, New Hampshire, all likely Democratic states. I'd also throw in Nebraska's second congressional district, a state that I do think right now uh, Kamala Harris is in a district that I think Kamala Harris is in a really strong position to do quite well in. I also have Nebraska's first as a likely red district. That's how it was back in 2020. Don't think much, gonna, much is going to change, especially that Kamala Harris and her, and her campaign are investing nearly $10 million in the Omaha region. The Trump campaign, in contrast, is spending zero dollars. Democrats are investing heavily in this one district in Nebraska. It has residual effects on surrounding districts in the state and in the region. And the Omaha area is going to see a benefit for Kamala Harris because of the investments her campaign and herself are making in this region of the United States. And so this brings us to roughly 190 electoral votes. Now, you might be surprised to see states like Texas and Florida and Alaska currently characterized as toss ups. And I give you that. I think that right now where we are, these states are going to be Republican states. But it is the margin at which I am most intrigued by that I think will really help dictate how the rest of this map goes. Now, a recent data point out of Alaska shows Donald Trump ahead by just four to five points in the state of Alaska. That's repetitive. But this was, uh, and to say Alaska again, Alaska Survey Research, the most accurate pollster in this state. Now, it has never been a battleground state. Democrats have not won Alaska dating back a very, very long time. Over half a uh, century was the last time the Democrats won in the state of Alaska in 1964 was when Lyndon B. Johnson beat Barry Goldwater in this state by 32 points. But since then, it has been practically Ruby, Ruby Republican. Up until recently, when Donald Trump won the state by 10.1%, and then two years later, they elected a Democratic congresswoman to uh, represent them across the state against Sarah Palin, the Trump handpicked candidate, former governor and vice presidential nominee for John McCain in 2008. Alaska went to the Democratic Party. And what we have seen here is a recent tightening up. I gave it a little bit more discussion than I have historically because of this new poll, because of, again, this most accurate pollster in the state that really helps dictate how Alaska goes. And what we are seeing here is that Republicans are in a position where they aren't as strong as they were in 2020, not as strong as they were in 2016, and certainly not as strong as they were in 2012 or 2008. And so right now I say Alaska 
is a likely red state. Beyond that point, too, we have 187 remaining electoral votes. 187 remaining electoral votes. As I said, Texas and Florida are going to go to the Republican Party. But right now, I will say, Democrats have a huge war chest and might start investing in these states. I don't think they're necessarily going to win these states, but they are going to be in a position where they are going to lay out the groundwork to win in the future. Overall, I think Texas and Florida should be characterized as lean Republican states. Now, in my recent prediction, I had Florida as a likely red state. I do think that we're starting to see the tides turn ever so slightly, and continuous data points out of the state uh, are showing us that it is narrowing down a little bit more than it needs to be for the Republicans. You see, I've been under the opinion that Donald Trump would win Florida by five, six, seven points. I now think he's probably somewhere in the range of three, four, five points. I think Florida has seen a change over time, over the past two years, over the past four years, but I do think at this point in time, based on who Kamala Harris is bringing back into the Democratic Party, how they're expanding the vote share amongst white voters and inspiring a vote base in Florida combined with the abortion referendum on the ballot, I don't doubt Donald Trump wins Florida, but I think he's somewhere around 4.5 to 5 points rather than 6, 7, 8, 9 points like he was against Joe Biden. So Florida for now is going to be a lean red state. Texas, I'm a little bit more cynical on for Republicans here. I still think they're going to win the state, but by when I say I mean win the state, that doesn't mean it's going to be 10 points. In 2020, it was 5.6. I think it'll be closer this time around, and I think it will continue to be closer until it flips blue. Texas is a state that Democrats are going to start investing in. Whether now, whether later, that's up to them. But it is a state that has been what used to be the Republican Party's California, a massive electoral vote dump routinely electable for the Republican Party now today being far more competitive than it has ever been. The Senate race here is even more competitive. Definitely would encourage taking a look at that race as well. So now we're down to the 117 electoral votes that I think are going to truly determine the outcome uh, of this uh, race. Overall, I think where we are on the national standpoint, Democrats are really focused on seven states. Republicans are really focused on seven states. There are more than seven states on this electoral map right now. And that is just by the nature of some of these states that historically have been more competitive being, you know, I want to be competitive this time around, but not really, right? For some of these states like Ohio and Iowa, we know how they're going to go. For some districts like Maine 2nd that has shown recent tightening in some of the data points out of that district, yes, we know that they used to be competitive and used to be states the Democrats would fight for, campaign and et cetera, but they aren't going to be truly that competitive. The residual effect of swing states is that they do show some signs of tightening. They do sway with the nation because there are swing voters in these states. In fact, there's swing voters all across the nation. But they're at the edge here where they used to be far more competitive. And when we do start to see some reductions, they do raise some alarm bells for the national candidates, but they don't raise enough to say that they are going to sway in the opposite way. For instance, a state like Ohio. I think J.D. Vance being on the ticket there does in fact help J uh, Donald Trump here. Regardless, he was going to win the state by probably six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 points, depending on where we are. Moving over to the state of Iowa, though, what we saw out of that new Ann Seltzer poll was that Donald Trump is ahead by four points in this state. Now, that is certainly alarming. This is a state, again, that Donald Trump won by nine points, eight, nine points in the last election in 2016. It was nearly 10. And so Iowa's a state that historically had actually been pretty strong for the Democratic Party. You can see in 2012, they won by 5.6. In 2008, they won by 9.5. And so Donald Trump really changed the trajectory of Iowa. But now that it's tightening again, I really do trust Ann Seltzer. I will say she's one of the few pollsters that I will completely uh, push past my prediction in favor of hers and really understanding her methodology and her current assessment of the race. And right now, Iowa is a state that I would say is lean Republican, largely because of this poll. I know we rarely ever give that much merit and credit to the polls that we see and analyze on this channel, but I will say this. There are very few polls that I think genuinely provide a near perfect context and understanding of how certain states go. Iowa has the Des Moines Register and Ann Seltzer. Alaska has Alaska Survey Research. Many other states really don't have that perfect poll, but these two states do, and that's why they're getting a little bit more attention than normal. But Iowa narrowing down is something that I think is quite interesting. I do believe, though, in about a week, two weeks, three weeks, it'll go back to being likely red, and I wouldn't be shocked if it does. Just right now, it seems to be that Donald Trump is seeing some losing of support in the Midwestern region, uh, where he really, really can't afford to lose any support across the remaining battleground states. And so moving over to Maine 2nd District 2, that brings me to that point. I think this one is also going to be a lean Republican state. It's a state the Democrats, uh, sorry, district. The district the Democrats used to win, but not by too much. Donald Trump really tapped into the base there, really drove them out to vote for him in 2016. Then again in 2020, I would say right now it's a lean Republican district. It has seen some tightening, especially with Jared Golden being a relatively popular Democratic congressman from, that, uh, from Maine 2nd. And I do think too, 
Democrats, again, investing into the New England region, investing in areas that the Trump campaign simply doesn't have the money or cash on hand to do so. That's where you're starting to see some of the benefit there. And I think Democrats have a really coordinated effort to win back some of these white working class voters. Maine has a lot of them. Maine second certainly does as well. And so now this brings us to a point. 93 remaining electoral votes that are, as I've been saying for the entire campaign period now, the states that both parties are really only focused on. As much as they announce that they're opening campaign field offices in Florida, Minnesota, Virginia, Texas, the main focus are the seven states, and they are going to receive half a billion dollars in advertisement sending between now and Election Day. It's insane to think about, but our current American reality. And so these 93 toss of electoral votes, there are some states that are more positive for Trump and more positive for, uh, for Harris than others. And I want us to really understand and unpack that. At face value, these are all states except for North Carolina that went to Biden back in 2020. These are all states besides the state of Nevada that went to Trump in 2016. And so it really is anybody's game depending on how the national landscape ends up. But after this first presidential debate, in the day and age today, voters were to vote today, how voters view that first presidential debate, they view Donald Trump, uh, Kamala Harris after that first presidential debate, we are in a position now where Kamala Harris is probably riding pretty high and doing quite well in the state. And so what are we finding? Donald Trump, uh, in these states, rather not in the state, in these states. Kamala Harris will probably be able to win in the state of Wisconsin, win in the state of Michigan, win in the state of Pennsylvania. These are all states the Democrats have been focusing on really heavily over the past three and a half years because they know these are amongst the most competitive ones in the entire country. Kamala Harris, I think, would provide them that electoral college vote victory. And that's enough. That brings her to 270 electoral votes, but that isn't really too much of a shock, right? And we're talking about uh, a time frame like this where she does really well at the first debate. She does really well nationally. Why is it that she's stuck at just 270 electoral votes? Well, honestly, I don't think she's stuck at 270 electoral votes. I think she's on track to do better than this. And where does that come in? In some states that are pretty likely to see how they come in. States like Nevada, where I do think that Hil uh, Kamala Harris is in a position similar to Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden that she wins this state relies on the traditional Democratic voting base there. I do think you do lose some support, as I've been saying, in some of these states, given the fact that the border crisis uh, for Democrats really isn't an issue that they're winning on. But it does, in fact, find that Kamala Harris being from this region of the United States, having won elections in similar areas, a competitive attorney general's race, winning in her Senate race, too. And not to mention the fact that Nevada, again, is a state that Republicans haven't cracked since 2004. It's always this election until it's not. And then it's the next election until it's not. And so looking at Nevada right now, I do think Kamala Harris is the favorite based on history, based on current standing, based on national standing. I would say Nevada is a uh, very tilt Democratic state. But regardless, the victory is a victory, winner take all. Kamala Harris gets all six electoral votes. I was previously also a bit more cynical on the state of Arizona for Kamala Harris for a number of reasons. But as of late, I've come to understand more in understanding how abortion referendums impact up ballot races. For instance, you've seen a lot of organizing, millions of dollars of organizing in Arizona recently surrounding the abortion referendum. And voters who get out to vote largely in favor of a pro-choice amendment are probably voting blue too, even if they aren't necessarily inspired by Kamala Harris or Ruben Gallego or whoever's running on their bottom ballot ticket. Arizona is a state where you could see a narrow pushover similar to Katie Hobbs because of this issue of abortion that does drive voters out, even if Republicans have set up a better campaign in the state and on the issues Republicans win over the majority of voters in the state. At fundamental baseline, 2022 showed this. Arizona is a state that is competitive, and when faced with the option of Trump versus not, more often than not, they're choosing the not option. And I think that will be the case this election. Kamala Harris will narrowly get by similar to Joe Biden, and I do think Arizona right now is a tilt Democratic state. And so this brings us to the final two states, North Carolina and Georgia, and it actually is quite surprising, you know, where we are in these states. Kamala Harris's campaign has seemed to invest a lot of money in the state of North Carolina, investing even more than Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. She's visiting the state more than both of these candidates and is focusing on a lot of the youth initiatives in these states. Look at the collegiate chapters for Kamala Harris in the state of North Carolina. Look at what she's doing, getting Tim Walls to visit a number of these college campuses, not only in North Carolina, she, he's doing so across the Midwest, across the southwestern region of the United States, but North Carolina is a state that I've seen, I think we've seen a unique interest from Kamala Harris's candidacy because of the fact that Asian American voters uh, and black voters in North Carolina comprise of a major part of the voting population in the state and really do drive voters to turn out uh, candidates like Kamala Harris. You know, when you're talking about North Carolina, 
A big reason I think that Barack Obama was able to win there in 2008 was the fact that he inspired groups of the Democratic electorate that traditionally are not expired, inspired by people like Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton. Not to mention the fact that just in an enthusiastic campaign, it takes that for Democrats to win in North Carolina. It can't be a settle for Biden campaign. It can't be a never, uh, you know, a Bernie or bust campaign that wins a state like North Carolina. It needs to be a unified Democratic Party that inspires both older and younger voters both minority and white voters. And in North Carolina, I think we're seeing that perfect medium where Kamala Harris right now, despite what we have seen in historical elections, is the narrow favorite to win the state right now. Now, this is the current state of the race, riding high after the debate and doing really well in terms of fundraising and organizing in battleground states. Things can change in 50 days. But 50 days out, I think North Carolina might be the state that next votes blue and Georgia votes red. Now, that might shock you, and I forgive you if it is, because in 2020, when I was thinking about, you know, these predictions here, that Georgia would go blue, but Florida would not, I was really flabbergasted, right? I even had my own prediction back in 2020 that North Carolina and Florida would also be voting blue because it didn't make sense. Georgia was a state that we saw Donald Trump win by 5.6 in 2016, 5.1 rather. I'm overinflating it. So 5.1. Florida went to Trump by just 1.2. North Carolina, arguably, by 3.7 less than Georgia. But four years later, North Carolina ended up narrowing just two points. Florida ended up shifting right two points. But Georgia shifted nearly six points to the left. North Carolina, I think, could be in that case right now. Now, not six points. I think Kamala Harris, if she wins the state, it will happen narrowly. But based on the investments we are seeing in North Carolina, and the fact is Kamala Harris is getting her biggest rallies out of this battleground state in particular, in contrast with Georgia, which I do think Democrats stand to have a really good fighting chance here. But if 2022 showed me anything, it was that even with the worst lackluster candidates, even in the 2021 runoffs, Georgia was still fundamentally so exceptionally conservative that Democrats couldn't win by more than two. Right now, North Carolina is a state that is conducive to Democratic victories. We see it in the governor elections that coincide with the presidential elections. Not to mention that this governor election with Mark Robinson will have a negative effect on Donald Trump's candidacy because so many voters are turning out to vote for Democrat Josh Stein. They are more than likely to vote for Kamala Harris at the top of the ticket, even if they were otherwise thinking about not voting at all. And so overall across our electoral map here, what we end up with is 303 electoral votes for Kamala Harris and 235 for Donald Trump. North Carolina flips blue. Georgia flips red. Overall, though, Kamala Harris wins with over 270 electoral votes. Now, 50 days out, this is an election prediction that I would certainly want to revisit on election day and afterwards, because we're in a really interesting scenario nationwide. Kamala Harris being able to flip North Carolina, but lose Georgia, something that I don't think many people really saw coming. But it reminds me a lot of the 2016 to 2020 change. And that, sure, winning states before or coming close to winning states before uh, are states that make sense to target. Georgia being one of those states that it makes sense to target and play defense in. But it doesn't mean it's outside the realm of possibility that you do, in fact, lose Georgia, but win North Carolina when you're investing nearly just as much, when you're visiting the state more, when you're getting more people on the ground in the state, and when it's worth the exact same in terms of electoral count, it isn't really that shocking that Democrats are, in fact, spending tens of millions of dollars in the same way they're spending tens of millions of dollars in Georgia. And so overall, final map here, 303 for Kamala Harris, 235 for Donald Trump. 50 days out, my prediction is Kamala Harris would be the first woman elected president of the United States in history. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the top left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.